chapter 4, containing a necessary apology for the author and a childish incident which perhaps requires an apology likewise. Before I proceed farther, I shall beg leave to obviate some misconstructions into which the zeal of some few readers may lead them, for I would not willingly give offence to any, especially to men who are warm in the cause of virtue or religion. I hope, therefore, no man will, by the grossest misunderstanding or perversion of my meaning, misrepresent me as endeavouring to cast any ridicule on the greatest perfections of human nature, and which do indeed alone purify and ennoble the heart of man and raise him above the brute creation. This, reader, I will venture to say, and by how much the better man you are yourself, by so much the more will you be inclined to believe me, that I would rather have buried the sentiments of these two persons in eternal oblivion than have done any injury to either of these glorious causes. On the contrary, it is with a view to their service that I have taken upon me to record the lives and actions of two of their false and pretended champions. A treacherous friend is the most dangerous enemy, and I will say boldly that both religion and virtue have received more real discredit from hypocrites than the wittiest profligates or infidels could ever cast upon them. Nay, Father, as these two in their purity are rightly called the bands of civil society, and are indeed the greatest of blessings, so when poisoned and corrupted with fraud, pretense, and affectation, they have become the worst of civil curses, and have enabled men to perpetrate the most cruel mischiefs to their own species. Indeed, I doubt not, but this ridicule will in general be allowed." My chief apprehension is, as many true and just sentiments often came from the mouths of these persons, lest the whole should be taken together, and I should be conceived to ridicule all alike. Now the reader will be pleased to consider that, as neither of these men were fools, they could not be supposed to have holden none but wrong principles, and to have uttered nothing but absurdities. What injustice, therefore, must I have done to their characters had I selected only what was bad, and how horribly wretched and maimed must their arguments have appeared? Upon the whole, it is not religion or virtue, but the want of them which is here exposed. Had not Thwackham too much neglected virtue and square religion in the composition of their several systems, and had not both utterly discarded all natural goodness of heart, they had never been represented as the objects of derision in this history in which we will now proceed. This matter, then, which put an end to the debate mentioned in the last chapter, was no other than a quarrel between Master Bliffill and Tom Jones, the consequence of which had been a bloody nose to the former. For though Master Bliffill, notwithstanding he was the younger, was in size above the other's match, yet Tom was much his superior at the noble art of boxing. Tom, however, cautiously avoided all engagements with that youth, for besides that Tommy Jones was an inoffensive lad amidst all his roguery and really loved Bliffle, Mr. Thwackham, being always the second of the latter, would have been sufficient to deter him. But well says a certain author, no man is wise at all hours. It is therefore no wonder that a boy is not so. A difference arising at play between the two lads, Master Bliffle called Tom a beggarly bastard. Upon which the latter, who was somewhat passionate in his disposition, immediately caused that phenomenon in the face of the former which we have above remembered. Master Bliffel now, with his blood running from his nose and the tears galloping after from his eyes, appeared before his uncle and the tremendous Thwackham, in which court an indictment of assault, battery and wounding was instantly preferred against Tom who in his excuse only pleaded the provocation, which was indeed all the matter that Master Bliffle had omitted. It is indeed possible that this circumstance might have escaped his memory, for in his reply he positively insisted that he had made use of no such appellation, adding, heaven forbid such naughty words should ever come out of his mouth. 
Tom, though against all form of law, rejoined in affirmance of the words, upon which Master Bliffle said, It is no wonder those who will tell one fib will hardly stick at another. If I had told my master such a wicked fib as you have done, I should be ashamed to show my face. What fib, child? cries Thwackum pretty eagerly. Why, he told you that nobody was with him a-shooting when he killed the partridge, but he knows. Here he burst into a flood of tears. Yes, he knows, for he confessed it to me, that Black George the gamekeeper was there. Nay, he said, yes, you did. Deny it if you can, that you would not have confessed the truth, though Master had cut you to pieces. At this... The fire flashed from Thwackum's eyes, and he cried out in triumph, Oh, ho! Oh, this is your mistaken notion of honour. This is the boy who was not to be whipped again. But Mr. Allworthy, with a more gentle aspect, turned towards the lad and said, Is this true, child? How came you to persist so obstinately in a falsehood? Tom said he scorned a lie as much as any one, but he thought his honour engaged him to act as he did, for he had promised the poor fellow to conceal him, which, he said, he thought himself farther obliged to, as the gamekeeper had begged him not to go into the gentleman's manor, and had at last gone himself in compliance with his persuasions. He said this was the whole truth of the matter, and he would take his oath of it, and concluded with very passionately begging Mr. Allworthy to have compassion on the poor fellow's family, especially as he himself only had been guilty, and the other had been very difficultly prevailed on to do what he did. Indeed, sir, said he, it could hardly be called a lie that I told, for the poor fellow was entirely innocent of the whole matter. I should have gone alone after the birds, nay, I did go at first, and he only followed me to prevent more mischief. Do pray, sir, let me be punished. Take my little horse away again, but pray, sir, forgive poor George. Mr. Allworthy hesitated a few moments and then dismissed the boys, advising them to live more friendly and peaceably together.